Welcome everyone to Lucha World's countdown to the 10 greatest trios in Lucha Libre history. Fredo Esparza here. Again, as I mentioned in the previous videos on the 10 greatest luchadoras in, of all time and 10 greatest tag teams in Lucha Libre history, these lists are compiled by myself. You can agree or disagree with it. It's perfectly fine. Um, if you'd like to give your share your opinion, feel free to post in the comment section below or you can tweet me at the real Fredo or at Lucha World. And you can even put you can even leave a message at the Lucha World Facebook page as well. For many fans who first got into Lucha Libre in the past 30, 40 years, the odds are the first match they watched was a six man or a relevos australianos, or what many of us are more familiar with, these matches being called trios matches. Trios matches have been a far greater staple on Lucha Libre shows since the 1980s. In fact, there have been numerous shows throughout the years that would feature five to six trios matches. Depending on the year and the depth of the talent available, available that could be good, and at times that could be very bad. Nowadays, in the past 10 years, for some fans, if the first time watching Lucha, they might have not it might have not been a lucha a trios match because um, there's been a little bit more of a of a change, more so with AAA and some of the independent promotions where they do more singles matches. Um, CMLL st still kind of sticks to the a lot of trios matches on their shows. There's still there's more singles matches and tag matches, but it's mostly a lot of trios matches. So for a lot of fans, like I said, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, um, odds are your first lucha libre match. And when I talk about, when I refer to Lucha Libre, I'm talking about, you know, matches from Mexico directly, not, you know, Lucha Libre match that you might have watched on the, on, you know, WCW or, or, or WWE when they had luchadors or they've had luchadors. It, I mean, more of when you're watching CMLL, AAA, or in the past UWA uh, or independent promotions, or who knows what other promotions had TV at, at certain points in the past. There were trios matches prior to 1980, as difficult as it might be for some to believe because so much of the talk about trios wrestling comes from the 1980s boom, started out by top trios being formed and working in EMLL, Promociones Mora, which is better known to many of us as UWA and other independent promotions. The trios list is loaded. This is a category that is very loaded. Um, I think it was easier for me to come up with the women and tag teams just because you might have missed a couple of tag teams or women, but this is one of the more loaded categories just because you could have actually done the top 100. I could have actually done a top 100 trio, um, trios in Lucha Libre history, and I probably would have still missed a couple of trios because um, obviously, you know, there's always going to be some trio that you're going to forget or some trio that you might have underestimated at a, at a time. And then when you look back, you realize that they were actually better or some that you might actually have overrated because um, they they were memorable, but not particularly great. Um, so honestly, trios, there are many. Um, you can't really go wrong with what trio you want to list because there have been many throughout the years that have had tremendous success either as uh, attendance draws, work rate, innovation or impact in professional wrestling. Several of these trios have had multiple versions that have experienced success with different members. We rank these trios with their overall body of work as a unit. Some trios stick solely together with the same threesome while others change members as the trio gets revived with a new version in later years. So when I made the list, I decided to keep what would be the, the entirety of the trio. So for example, the Los Hermanos Dinamita was always the threesome of the three brothers, Cien Caras, Mascareño 2000, Universo 2000. So I didn't split th that trio up. I did the same. So while with the girls del, del Infierno, Los Infernales, um, they had multiple versions of their trios. I kind of kept all of those trios together. If we did a top 100, I would probably split them all up because it would be a, a lot easier to do. And you probably would have a bit of a different top 10 because uh, obviously as uh, as you take out the history of the of those trios and start splitting them into different groups then you start seeing a, a big difference as far as what that trio was like throughout his, their body of work in history but in this case since we did a top 10 we kept them all together so before we get to the top 10 how about a list of the honorable mention trios that i have split into two groups 
Um, what I did was I included, like I said, I included if there was a fourth member that came in later on and to replace one of the other members, that, that automatically gets together with that group. Uh, but amongst those that were unmentioned were Los Cadetes del Espacio, Solar One, Super Astro and Ultraman, Los Hermanos Máscara, Mil Máscaras, Dos Caras and Psicodélico, Trio Fantasia, Super Muñeco, Super Pinocho and Super Raton, The Sky Team, which consisted of Mystico, Caristico, um, actually both versions, first, you know, the Mystico of the past, who later became Caristico, and the Mystico, the more recent one, teaming up with Volador Jr. and La Sombra, and also later La um, Valiente. Los Laguneros, which was this really cool trio from the early 2000s that consisted of Dr. Wagner Jr., Blue Panther, and Black Warrior. Black Warrior was later replaced by Fuerza Guerrera. Uh, Los Psycho Circus, Monster Clown, Murder Clown, and Psycho Clown. Los Bucaneros, Pirata Morgan, um, Jerry Strada, and then Ombre Bala and Verdugo. Um, obviously, once Jerry Strada left, the other two, it became more of a brother um, trio. Los Guerreros, not to be confused with um, the Guerrero family, this is Los Guerreros, which consists, or the Guerreros Infernales, um, Guerreros del Infierno. Um, this is Los Guerreros, which consisted of Sangre Chicana, Mochocota, and La Fiera. Triangulo de la Muerte, which was Cuchillo, Caos, and Rambo. Los Tres Caballeros, Aníbal, Solitario, and Viano Tercero. Los Temerarios, Black Terry, José Luis Feliciano, and Lobo Rubio, and later Shuel Guerrero. Los Arqueros del Espacio, Danny Boy, Lacer, and Robin. Los Payasos, Payaso Coco Amarillo, Payaso Coco Azul, and Payaso Coco Rojo. Los Havana Brothers, Rocky Romero, Puma, who later became TJ Perkins, TJP, and Rocco who was better known in the United States as Bobby Quantz, and Los Thundercats, Leono, Pantro, and Tigro. This is the first group. The second group of honorable mentions, and again, like I said, if you did a top 100, um, I would be able to split up all the, all the trios by, by, the, the, by membership, and of course, you would then have the Santo-led trios, which would definitely be um, on a top 100 list and probably fill up at least... Between, anywhere between 10 and 15 spots. Who knows how many trios El Santo had. But um, for the most part, the ones that um, are the more famous ones are the ones that actually won awards. Um, the first one, of course, being El Santo, Médico Asesino and El, el Enfermero. Um, that was followed by El Santo, Real de Jalisco and Mil Mascaras. El Santo, Black Shadow and Blue Demon, rivals who later teamed up briefly. El Santo, Rey Mendoza and Mil Mascaras. El Santo, Mil Mascaras and El Solitario. El Santo, Rayo de Jalisco, and Huracán Ramirez. El Santo was very was involved with a lot of trios where the he would be the the veteran. They would throw in another veteran, and then they would have a young wrestler in in a couple of these trios, like with Mil Mascaras, um, El Solitario, and Huracán Ramirez. I think Alberto Munoz was also in one of the trios that um that El Santo um led. Um, they were kind of used as he was kind of used as like the godfather of those wrestlers because. Um, EML at the time thought they were getting someone who was going to be a huge superstar. And for the most part, they did end up getting somebody that, you know, got a little bit of a rub from El Santo and would end up being a, a big star for the promotion and in, in Lucha Libre. So now let's go to the top 10. Coming in at number 10, I have Los Hermanos Dinamita, Cien Caras, Mascareño 2000, and Universo 2000, who were together for about 20 years. Uh, when they were first formed, the trio seemed to be a way of, for the younger brothers to get the rub from their already popular and well-established Rudo, Rudo brother, Carmelo Reyes, known as Cien Caras. Over the years, they would become a very solid unit that were used as headliners, opposing some of the top heavyweight technicos. The trio was more known for being brawlers and didn't necessarily have the impact that other trios had with what they did in the ring, but they were very popular with the fans. They held the Mexican National Trios titles, but for the most part, they were more used as the big Rudo trio out to make some of the top technicals lives miserable. They feuded with Rayo de Jalisco Jr., Paraguayo Conan, Super Porky, Atlantis, Los Infernales, Paraguayo Jr., the list went on and on. Um, they were so popular that when Antonio Peña formed AAA, Los Hermanos Dinamita were part of the group that jumped from CMLL. Again, while in AAA, they were used at the top Rudos feuding with Conan and Paraguayo. Cien Caras was the one who would get the big push to feud in singles matches. When they made their return to CMLL in the mid-1990s, they continued to be a top Rudo trio, but they, by that point, 
Cien Caras was getting older. Their style of trios matches, which were mostly brawls, were not holding up to the younger and smaller luchadors' quicker type of matches. They were still kept strong and that with CMLL using skits to build up feuds on TV. They did well as part of the Los Capos faction, which was a huge storyline. They would feud with um, Super Porky and then later on Paraguayo and CMLL. Basically, they pretty much feuded with the same group of guys for the most part. Um, the trio got a bit of a revival in the early 2000s, feuding with Pir- Piros Bariquas, and even more so later when Paraguayo and Paraguayo Jr. joined CMLL and feuded with them. By about 2008, Cien Caras cut back on his wrestling schedule and the trio would only team on occasion for legend shows. At number 9, Los Fantasticos, which mainly consisted of Kung Kung Fu, Black Man, and Kato Kung Lee. Super Kendo and Avispo Negro would team up at times as part of the trio. Um, This trio started off with Kung Fu and Kato Kung Lee teaming up in EMLL in the late 70s as they were characters inspired by Bruce Lee and martial arts movies that were very popular at that time. They would add martial arts spots in their move sets. Kato Kung Lee also developed into one of the best luchadors when it came to using the ropes, which includes him rope walking and adding a- another dimension to what luchadors could do within a wrestling ring. Kato Kung Lee and Kung Fu initially teamed with Satoru Sayama, who later became famous as Tiger Mask. They were teamed with Sayama and EM- EML as a trio known as Triangulo Oriental. It wasn't until they both left EMLL to join the rival promotion Promociones Mora, UWA, where they would join with Black Man that they would form Los Fantasticos. Black Man also had a very interesting career. He previously had wrestled as La Gacela and Spider-Man, and he actually was a very talented wrestler. In fact, um, he was so good, but he wasn't getting that huge push because he was smaller during the early 70s. So he would usually get re-gimmicked. And people, there was a big controversy when he when he wrestled under a mask that he um, that it kind of caught get, he got heat because he was still wrestling as Gacela, an unmasked wrestler at that point in time. And then he was wrestling masked. So there was a lot of um, magazine press at that point in time. Um, but he gained a lot more um, fame as Black Man um, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s. While Kato Kung Lee and Kung Fu were flashier, Black Man was a more complete luchador. The trio would beat Los Cadetes del Espacio in a tournament final on March 18, 1984 to become the first UWA World Trios champions. That tournament featured some of the best trios of that era, including Los Brazos, the trio of Agua Paraguayo, Dr. Wagner and Fishman, Los Misioneros de la Muerte, Los Temerarios, and Triangulo de la Muerte. The original trio had a memorable two-year run to kick off before they broke up with Black Man remaining in UWA, Kung Fu heading to EMLL. Kato Kung Lee was very much in high demand as an independent wrestler, so he just decided to go independent, so he would wrestle on occasion on EMLL and UWA shows, but he was mostly independent, um, and he wrestled practically everywhere. Um, but he would he, he was pretty much an independent by the late 80s. Um, each of the original Fantasticos tried to form new versions of the trio but could never reach the level of success that the original trio had. They all had successful singles careers after with each having big mask losses as well. Black Man lost his mask to Blue Panther on February 16, 1986. Kato Kung Lee would follow losing his mask to El Hijo del Santo on November 28, 1986 in Tijuana. Kung Fu would be the last to do so when he lost his mask to Atlantis on October 26, 1990 in Arena, Mexico. At number 8, the trio of Karloff Lagarde, Ray Mendoza, and Rene Guajardo. Um, one of the best trios during the mid-1950s through the 1960s that would have a big impact in and out of the ring in Mexican wrestling. Rene Guajardo, Karloff Lagarde, and Ray Mendoza were top singles wrestlers throughout their careers, but they were very effective as a Rudo trio. They were all top draws, and when in trios matches, they would face the top technicals of the time like El Santo, Rayo de Jalisco, Blue Demon, Ruben Juarez, Dory Dixon, Humberto Garza, the list would go on and on in trios matches. They also had a Rudo versus Rudo rivalry with another great trio from the 1960s, Los Hermanos Espanto. These matches were famous during that time for being very bloody, wild brawls. Guajardo, Lagarde, and Mendoza's trio wasn't just about them being a team in the ring. They were also real-life best friends. 
they were they also were the backstage leaders of the EMLL roster that made sure everyone was taken care of, given the Luteros focusing more on maintaining a successful business and at times overlooking the needs of or feelings of the wrestlers under their employment. The trio would usually be the ones to talk to the bosses in hopes of improving salaries and working conditions within EMLL. Much like other trio breakups, they too had a heated breakup that led to their feud headlining arenas throughout Mexico. Mendoza's popularity in 1965 was rising and a lot of that had to do with him coming off as a blue collar type of guy with so many lucha magazines covering wrestlers' careers and personal lives. Mendoza had a tough life and would talk about how difficult the life of a wrestler was while coming off as a humble person that was winning over fans. The breakup led to Guajardo on the guard having heated battles with Mendoza, and but now Mendoza would be teaming with top technicals like El Santo and Mil Mascaras. They also had singles battles over titles and hair matches. Their friendship out of the ring maintained intact though despite their in-ring rivalry being a huge success. Salvador Lutero decided to add his son Chavo Lutero Jr. and grandson Francisco Paco Alonso Lutero to the office and gave, and gave them power in the early 1970s. The power shift also led to the younger Lutero's feeling it was time to move forward with younger wrestlers and move away from the older veteran wrestlers. By 1974, several veteran stars had already started to move on to becoming independent wrestlers with the idea that they, they could get more bookings on their own and they could always pick up dates with EMLL. Mendoza wasn't pleased with the direction EMLL was going, and since he was a veteran that they were going to try to de-emphasize, he along with Lagarde and Guajardo all left EMLL and joined up with Francisco Flores and other independent promoters and formed Promociones Mora in 1975. Mendoza brought along his sons, Los Villanos 1, 2, and 3, and continued to be a star. Guajardo and Lagarde continued to be stars, but each was cutting back on their schedule with Lagarde working fewer shows and Guajardo splitting his time between wrestling and being the promoter of La División del Norte, shows promoted in six arenas throughout North, northern Mexico. Coming in at number seven, I have Los Villanos. Rey Mendoza's five sons followed his path into Lucha Libre. Instead of using the Mendoza wrestling name in their career, they wrestled as the Masked Villanos. The five brothers would go on as Viano 1, Viano 2, Viano 3, Viano 4, and Viano 5. They also made the decision that they would stop at 5 with that representing that generation of Vianos. They all turned out to be very good wrestlers. Viano 3 overshadowed the rest of his brothers as he became a huge single superstar for Promociones Mora in the 1980s and continued to be a star in, a late, in his later years. He teamed with other family members throughout the years. Viano 1 and Viano 2 started off as a very good tag team. Viano 1 had some single success, but he's best remembered teaming with two early in their career in, in EMLL and then jumping to Promociones Mora when that group was formed. Los Vianos would be part of the 1980s trios boom. They were later joined by Viano 4 and Viano 5. The Vianos had a memorable feud with Los Brazos throughout the 80s as well as in later years, um, that feud continued on. The two trios went on to have a big trios mass match, which that was, which was both memorable and a disappointment at the box office. One of the interesting notes about that match is that sometimes fans would assume the trio of Vianos that won that mass match against Los Brazos were Viano 3, 4, and 5, but in reality, Viano 1 was in that match and not Viano 3. There being five brothers allowed for various combinations throughout the years. Once Viano 2 passed away in 1989 and Viano 1 decided to retire, the trio throughout the 90s and on consisted of Los Vianos 3, 4, and 5, and they had success in CMLL, AAA, and The Independence. Viano 4 and Viano 5 even spent several years in, in WCW. They've all held numerous titles over the years. The later versions stuck around a little too long and unfortunately for many fans, they witnessed them in arguably one of the worst matches in AAA history when they wrestled Los Psycho Circus at Triple Mania on August 9th, 2015. Uh, by that point, Viano 3 was in no condition to wrestle and shouldn't have, ha and that match should have never happened. I don't think we should judge the Vianos solely on that one match when they had a, a career that was as a trio, as a, as a group 
of over 20 years of in-ring success. At number six, I have Los Hermanos Espanto. Los Hermanos Espanto were the first trio that was recognized as a trio in that they had a name and with all wearing similar black and white mask and gear were packaged as a group. Um, for the most part during this time period, most trios comprised of single stars um, while Los Hermanos Espanto came off as a trio, as a unit. So they, they kind of were kind of like that. They were really the first um, legitimate trio in Lucha Libre um, in that they were packaged in that way. This trio was comprised of two brothers in Espanto 1 and Espanto 3 and a best friend, Espanto 2. The first two Espantos grew up as best friends and got into Lucha Libre in the 1950s. The youngest, Espanto 3, would debut in late 1962 and the trio would be formed. Los Hermanos Espanto were a terrific, charismatic trio that were big draws during the 1960s. They were a terrific brawling trio that got in the crowd riled up. During their time together, they had feuds with virtually every top technical in EMLL, including El Santo, Rolando Vera, Black Shadow, Huracan Ramirez, Mil Mascaras, Blue Demon, Doral Dixon, and Ruben Juarez. Um, again, they also had a pretty wild, brutal rivalry with the trio of Rene Guajardo, Carla Lagarde, and Ray Mendoza. Um, when I say that Los Hermanos Espanto got the fans riled up, you can go through numerous Lucha Libre magazines and you would hear, um, you would either see sto read stories about fans attacking them or you would actually get pictures of fans trying to attack them. And um, fortunately, um, Los Hermanos Espanto would, for the most part, try not to it, uh, confront the fans usually the referee and somebody and security or somebody else would get involved to make sure that you know the wrestlers wouldn't um, ha handle matters on their own although you know at certain points in time they had to and it could get a little bit rough um, for you know for for the fans really because they were the ones that were kind of they started off as a mass trio but all would tr drop their mask within a year one year period to legendary opponents the first to lose his mask was espanto 2 to ruben juarez on September 6, 1963 in Arena, Mexico. Espanto 1 would be next losing his mask to El Santo on October 26, 1963 in Arena, Mexico. And the last would be Espanto 3 losing his mask on June 12, 1964 to Huracan Ramirez. Los Hermanos Espanto were together for about six years. On May 30, 1968 in Monterrey, Nuevo Leon, Espanto 1 along with fellow wrestler El Misterio Negro 2 Popeye Franco would be killed by a cantina owner, a bar owner, during a fight. Coming in at number five is one of the group, first groups that I mentioned has numerous versions of them and all of them were very um, memorable, very good for the most part. Um, of course, I am talking about Los Guerreros del Infierno, Guerreros de la Atlantida, Guerreros Negros, Guerreros Laguneros, and at one point they were also just known as Los Guerreros. This trio came to be formed early in during an early 2000 break, 2000s breakup of Los Infernales when Ultimo Guerrero and Rey Bucanero turned on El Satanico and aligned themselves with Tarzan Boy. That quickly set, up, set them all up as one of CML's top trios and they, they've remained in that position for the past 20 years. Um, really the, the the group as it's, uh, itself. Um, really Ultimo Guerrero and the group. Um, the trio has changed at and at times they've been even become more of a faction with others rounding out the group. But their focus for the most part has been being one of Lucha Libre's most dominant trios. Ultimo Guerrero as a leader has been the one common denominator in the numerous versions of the trio and each version has had their share of success. If we go run, we'll run down the groups. The first group consisted of Los Guerreros del Infierno, which was Ultimo Guerrero, Rey Bucanero, and Tarzan Boy. They were later joined by Mascara Magica and, Ol and El Olimpico. That was then followed by Los Guerreros de la Atlantida when Atlantis turned Rudo and joined Ultimo Guerrero and Rey Bucanero. Uh, Rey Bucanero then left and was replaced by Dragon Rojo Jr. And then there were others who would come and go that included Eclipse, Olimpico, and Sangre Azteca. After that, they had a, another version, which was more of a super group. Um, even though they still had Girls of Atlantida, they had a super group that consisted of, um, which was called Los Guerreros Negros, which consisted of Ultimo Guerrero, Atlantis, and Negro Casas. And then there was, that was then followed by Los Guerreros, which was Ultimo Guerrero, Rey Escorpion, and Dragon Rojo Jr. 
And finally, Los Guerreros Laguneros, which is the current version, which consists of Ultimo Guerrero, Euphoria, and Gran Guerrero. Um, Niebla Roja was a member for several years. And then once he left, in the last two years, joining them was Templario. As a trio, they held the CML World Trios titles four times. They've had rivalries with practically every main event trio, technical trio that has been put together, including Sky Team. And of course, when they first formed, they feuded with El Satanico's version of Los Infernales during that time period, which consisted of Averno and Mephisto. Um, each version of the girls brought something different to the table. The original trio came in hot with the Tarzan Boy versus El Satanico feud and Ultimo Girl and Rey Bucanero establishing themselves as the best tag team in Mexico. The next trio had Atlantis in his first ever run as a Rudo after a 20 plus year run as a technical and the breakup of Ultimo Girl and Rey Bucanero. The third group with Casas joining Atlantis and Ultimo, Ultimo Girl was a super group. That was then followed by Ultimo Guerrero bringing in two younger luchadors and the two being elevated with Rey Scorpion becoming one of the top Rudos in Mexico and Dragon Rojo Jr. having a pretty good run in the middleweight division before injuries started to derail his career. The current version might be the most team-oriented unit as Ultimo Guerrero brought in his younger brother Gran Guerrero who had a rough start but has turned the corner and become a very good wrestler along with the giant Euphoria who is one of Lucha's better big men and an elite base for high flyers. They've been joined by Templario, who teams with them on occasion and might be the most talented of the group, which also kind of explains why he's not always regularly teaming with them, although that's more so because they're just sticking to the same um, trio and Templario's kind of been more of a guy who's been... Um, you know, they've even, um, CML has even made attempts of having him be you know, with other guys, but um, Templario wants to stick with Girls Laguneros. The trio has also been able to weather some big breakups throughout the years as every time there has been a breakup it seems that leads to a big match. Rey Bucanero, Atlantis, Rey Scorpion, Nebla Roja had feuds with Ultimo Guerrero and his cohorts after breakups. The Atlantis breakup led to one of CMLL's most successful anniversary runs that eventually led to Atlantis winning Ultimo Guerrero's mask. Coming in at number 4 I have Los Infernales. While Los Brazos and Los Misioneros de la Muerte were the two trios that best represent the 80s trio's boom out of El Toreo, Los Infernales were the cornerstone of EMLL, CMLL for three decades. This group has had numerous versions throughout the years. Each experienced success and at times when the trio would break up, it would lead to a hot rivalry for the promotion. The main force behind this trio throughout its numerous incarnations in EMLL and later CMLL was Daniel Lopez El Satanico. As the leader of the trio, they pretty much took on his identity of being evil Rudos who were also very good workers. Here's a rundown of the, ta- of the trio throughout the years in EMLL and s- later CMLL. The first group consisted of El Satanico, MS1, and Espectro Jr. Um, the original lineup with all three being young, talented EMLL guys who were being elevated. That was then followed by El Satanico, MS1, and Belzebu. Bel Cebu was a, a young guy who was going to be elevated at that point in time as well. Um, he didn't really end up becoming the big star for that group. For, for that, group. Um, that was then followed by the El Satanico, MS1, and Pirata Morgan group, which was the most successful version that split up when Pirata Morgan left to form Los Bucaneros and feuded with Los Infernales. Morgan would return in the early 90s to the lineup. After that, they had El Satanico, MS1, and Masacre, who were together for quite a bit of, of time. Um, eventually, that group was also split up. And for about a few years, we don't really see another Infernales group until when El Satanico brought along Ultimo Guerrero and Rey Bucanero. This actual group was formed, like I said, in 1999 when CML started elevating young, younger talent. CML would air skits were part of the ritual to become a member of the trio. El Satanico would have them walk through fire, and if they made it, they were in. The trio would break up, and El Satanico would feud with El Ultimo Girl, Rey Bucanero, and new partner Tarzan Boy over the Infernales name. This led to El Satanico forming Los Nuevos Infernales, which was, of course, El Satanico, Averno, and Mephisto. They feuded with the others over the name and eventually became Los Nuevos Infernales, while 
Ultimo Girl, Bucanero, and Tarzan Boy would go on as Guerreros del Infierno. Years later, Averno and Mephisto would turn on El Satanico and leave the trio, um, which would then lead to El, San El Satanico forming another version of Los Infernales with Euphoria and Nosferatu. The trio, um, you know, by this point, unfortunately, El Satanico was cutting down his schedule and the trio would just eventually ju disappear. Uh, really, they didn't do much. They actually, I think they tried to keep Euphoria and Nosferatu together. Um, they had Virus kind of team up with them, but it, and that's actually how they started the Cancerberos del Infierno. But um, by that point in time, um, that group was kind of starting to get eliminated. The most successful version of Los Infernales was without a doubt the one featuring El Satanico, MS Uno, and Pirata Morgan. Each was a single star, and one can look back at their history and find big matches and rivalries they were part of on their own. As a trio, they were charismatic rudos who could bump, sell, brawl, and work with any trio. The trio held the CML World Trios and Mexican National Trios titles. With El Satanico becoming a, rev a revered and beloved rudo in CMLL later in his career, CMLL would constantly find ways of using him to elevate young talent either in rivalries or having him team with, with them. In the case of Los Infernales, he could do both and led a new generation of Rudos. While teaming with Ultimo Girl and Rey Bucanero and later Averno and Mephisto, the trios were good, but there was also more, for, more focus on building the younger talent up by having them be either in tag team or singles matches. In recent years, there has been some nostalgia in bringing back Lucha Legends, and that brought El Satanico back on the scene. He feuded with Echicero, and during their feud, Echicero suggested El Satanico put the Infernalis name on the line so he could revive that trio. In some interviews, Echicero has even suggested if he were to win the rights to the name and revive the trio, he'd be, the, he'd be open to having El Satanico be part of this new trio. At number three, I have La Ola Blanca. The most memorable trio that was formed prior to the 1980s trio's boom was La Ola Blanca, featuring Dr. Wagner, El Angel Blanco, and El Solitario. Dr. Wagner and Angel Blanco were a successful tag team in EMLL during the 1960s. EMLL decided to have them form a trio with El, Soli with El Enfermero, um, but by that point in time, El Enfermero had slowed down and wasn't able to keep up with the more aggressive style of the younger of his younger co counterparts. Enter El Solitario, who had a very similar aggressive Rudo style and was getting a mega push in 1968. He then joined El Angel Blanco and Dr. Wagner as part of La Ola Blanca, the White Wave, trio that would really be a trio that seemed to transition Lucha Libre into including some of the elements that would popularize the El Toreo independent style of wrestling years later. They were a dominant trio with all three being very popular Rudos, and that of course would eventually lead to their breakup, with Angel Blanco and Dr. Wagner turning on El Solitario. El Solitario became a huge superstar as a technical and their feud went on for several years, with El Solitario winning both of their, his former trio's partners' masks. He beat El Angel Blanco for his mask on December 8, 1972 in Arena, Mexico, 13 years later, El Solitario would win the mask of Dr. Wagner at the Plaza de Toros Monumental in Monterrey, Nuevo León. After the split with El Solitario, Ángel Blanco and Dr. Wagner would form another successful version of La Ola Blanca with Gran Marcus. Um, tragedy would hit the famous trio of Ángel Blanco, Dr. Wagner, and El Solitario within a month-long period in 1986. El Solitario would pass away on April 6, 1986 at the age of 39. There were stories of what he passed away from, which seemed to be common during that time whenever a young wrestler would pass away. There seemed to be attempt to keep it quiet from the public, um, almost a cover-up. The family had sa said he died on the operation table from a heart attack, while others have said he died from an unconfirmed illness. Three weeks later, Angel Blanco, Dr. Wagner, along with Solar, Mano Negra, and Jungla Negra would be in a car accident that would take the life of Angel Blanco, and leave Dr. Wagner confined to a wheelchair for the remainder of his life. The other wrestlers in this um, car accident were okay besides suffering from emotional effects from being in a serious accident that saw a friend lose his life. There's also been other versions of La Ola Blanca later on done by junior versions of them. Um, they've had various versions of them, but none of them were at the level of success as La Ola Blanca, the original group. At number two, Los Brazos. 
another trio comprised of three brothers who were second generation luchadors as their father, Shadito Cruz, wrestled for several years in Mexico City. There have been numerous family members who have also become wrestlers, in fact. Shadito Cruz had a total of six sons who became luchadors. The Alvarado family has produced numerous wrestlers and over the years, with family members marrying into other wrestling families, the family tree keeps growing with more and more luchadors and luchadoras intertwined. For the most part, the main Los Brazos trio consisted of Brazo de Oro, Brazo de Plata, and El Brazo. There have been other versions that included other brothers, but for the most part, the main trio were the three originals that started it all. Los Brazos each had some level of success on their own in later years, and Brazo de Oro, prior to teaming up with his brothers, had shown some potential as a singles wrestler. When Brazo de Plata started wrestling, he and Brazo de Oro became a very good tag team. They even toured with New Japan Pro Wrestling early in their careers. There are stories told of how wild they were and their willingness to fight anyone who disrespected them. In fact, there are a lot of stories of how wild the Alvarado family were due, due to them being based in Mexico City and keeping their doors open to wrestlers who needed a place to stay. Black Terry has talked about being around the six brothers when they were kids and them getting into fights, trouble, and being wild while he stayed at their home when he was starting out in Promociones Mora. Once El Brazo joined them, and with the trio's boom in full effect, Los Brazos quickly became superstars. They, along with Los Misioneros de la Muerte, were the embodiment of what independent wrestling was in Mexico in the 80s, and in many ways how it continued going forward. The style was faster paced, rougher, wild brawls, and a mix of technical and high-flying wrestling. While EMLL kept to the, to the same traditional style, these two trios were gaining a reputation for being imposing trios that would give any opponent a tough match. Throughout the run, Los Brazos held the Distrito Federal trios. They were two-time national trios, three-time UWA world trios, CML world trios, Phil trios, WWA world trios champions. They had rivalries with every top trio from Los Misioneros de la Muerte, Los Infernales, Los Mercenarios. The list went on and on. Their greatest rivalry was against Los Villanos and the two families would constantly joke that they couldn't be in the same room because a fight would ensue. Los Brazos lost their mask all at the same time in a mask match against Los Villanos 1, 4, and 5 at the Plaza de Toros Monumental in Monterrey, Nuevo León on October 21, 1988. Many younger fans are more familiar with Los Brazos after they lost their mask to Los Villanos in 1988. They were able to bring comedy into their matches while still having fun, fast-paced matches in the EMLL and when wrestling in Japan. The older Brazo de Oro would scold the younger and more charismatic Brazo de Plata who would react with a tearful looking face. El Brazo was there to calm both down. By the mid-1990s, the trio would slowly cut down working together as Brazo de Plata's popularity in CMLL rose and he became used more as a singles wrestler. Brasso de Oro would work more behind the scenes for CMLL with an occasional run wrestling again, which usually led to him losing a hair match. He also became the leader of the wrestlers union, which he held until his death in 2017. El Brasso would leave CMLL and join AAA where he found a bit of a revival there doing comedy gimmicks like Latin Broiler, which was a spoof of Latin Lover. Finally, at number one, Los Misioneros de la Muerte. November 2nd, 1980, El Toreo de Cuatro Caminos, El Signo, Negro Navarro, and El Tejano teamed up to wrestle a trio of legends that included El Santo, Blue Demon, and Huracan Ramirez. The Rudo trio were young and hungry. In an interview with Lucha World a few years back, Negro Navarro admitted that they were all young and getting a big push and probably got carried away a bit working against the older legends. During the match, El Santo suffered a stroke. The fans and media placed the blame on his on his Rudo opponents. That day, the unnamed trio would be given their name. We were just individual singles wrestlers. From there since it was November 2nd, which is Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, that's where we got the name of the trio of Los Misioneros de la Muerte, Negro Navarro told Lucha World. After that, in the Toreo de Cuatro Caminos, there was a show with trios from El Toreo and from El Consejo, so that's where the trios became a big thing. Back then, when they 
they bring in foreigners to Mexico, we would face them. And we had a really good run together for close to 10 years. When El Santo finally decided to retire in 1982, his final match held at the El Toreo de Cuatro Caminos on September 12, 1982, would feature El Santo teaming up with three legends, Huracan Ramirez, El Solitario, and his longtime partner and friend, Gory Guerrero. Their opponents would be Pedro Guayo and Los Misioneros de la Muerte. This made for a wild scene in a farewell match as the Rudo Quartet got the crowd into a frenzy with how they brawled against the Technicos. Only El Solitario could keep up with them, but the older stars were able were only able to make comebacks against the younger Rudo counterparts. It was quite the farewell match. Much like Los Brazos, Los Misioneros de la Muerte embodied a more modern style of Lucha Libre that included matches going faster, being a little rougher, more high impact with some technical spots mixed in. All three had previous success as singles wrestlers before teaming up. Navarro and El Tejano were reaching their full potential when they were put together in the trio, while El Signo by the late 70s along with Viano Tercero were already being groomed as future stars of Promociones Mora. El Signo and Viano 3 would sometimes be put in main events in smaller arenas, and with those two in the main events, they would outdraw shows in those venues that would feature the already established veteran stars. Los Misioneros held the UWA trio's titles two times. They would feud with pretty much every trio, whether it was a trio made up of Lucha Legends, the UWA regular trios like Los Brazos, Vianos, Fantasticos, the EML trios, once both promotions decided to exchange talent and have show have shows mix, mixing talent from both promotions, and of course they faced off against trios comprised of New Japan wrestlers. It didn't matter if the trio of oppo- opposing them were Rudos or Technicos, Los Misioneros were prepared to give their opponents a beatdown. The original trio was together for nearly 10 years until El Tejano decided to join EMLL. Promociones Mora tried to keep Los Misioneros de la Muerte going after Tejano's departure as they tried adding Idomito, Rocky Santana, and then later Black Power to fill the void. Black Power stuck with the trio in the early 90s, but by that point, with UWA LLI starting to decline, the trio wasn't the same. All three members would actually find some success on their own in later years, as El Tejano, having left found success as part of Los Cowboys with El Dandy and Silver King in EMLL and even more so internationally teaming with Silver with just Silver King. He also had a long run in AAA as part of lo, the Los Consagrados faction in the late 90s, early 2000s that was there to feud with Paraguayo and Paraguayo Jr. Sadly, he would pass away in 2006. El Signo would make some appearances in various promotions over the years with the most prominent probably being in 2000 through 2001 with CMLL when after Viano Tercero lost his mask and turned technical, the two would feud. They had a hair match on July 29, 2001, which CML at the time said they would be selling the videotape of the show, which was unheard of from them at that time. They never released the videotape, outraging many a Lucha fan. Nero Navarro would reinvent himself and his wrestling into what is now referred to as the maestro style of Yaveo or Yaveo style that became very popular in the independence in the early 2000s when he and Solar started working matches that way. They would later be joined by more older luchadors who would wrestle the way they did in the past, which was different compared to the styles that were gaining popularity in Mexico, like more high flying oriented or lucha extrema. So there you have it the top 10 trios of all time. If you want to give an opinion, or even put down your own list, do so below in the comments section. And um, again, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, We will have more here on the Retro Wrestling YouTube channel. Uh, 